So we're going to talk a little about first about kind of how Maggie and I met and some of the initiatives that we're um, working on and accomplishing here in Colorado Springs and also kind of generally in the front range of Colorado. And then we'll go through some of the plants um, and what their uses are and some common plants that you may see uh, in and around Colorado and the front range. We'll start with a land acknowledgement. So Colorado Springs um, is a city in, ancient, in the ancient homeland of the Ute tribe, um, three main bands that lived in Colorado Springs, or what is Colorado Springs now. Um, and we are lucky enough to live next to Garden of the Gods, which is a very important site for many of the Ute bands um, in Colorado and Utah. So we pay respect to the Ute people's past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Ute diaspora. So to start, um, I'll kind of show you a little bit about what I've done in the state of Colorado. So when I started uh, this top right picture, I was in Fort Collins um, at CSU, and I started working at the seedling tree farm um, in Fort Collins. And this is a tree farm that grows only native species to Colorado. Um, and then they take this plant material and they distribute this plant material throughout the state in our local parks. Um, and also they sell to the public so people can do revegetation of their own. And that's something that we'll talk about as we move on. Um, but from Fort Collins, I moved down to Durango. So pretty much the opposite corner of the state. And I learned to ranch and farm um, in Durango using more holistic methods when we're talking about agriculture. Um, so learning how to use the land and work with the land um, rather than fighting mother nature um, and a lot of what I learned on the ranch I've taken to uh, the job here in Colorado Springs as a city horticulturist and then before I came to the city um, I was the horticulture curator at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo uh, which is a pretty special zoo here in Colorado um, where I did all of the horticulture um, and the design of the exhibits at the zoo. Um, so when I started uh, at the city, we're about a year and a half at the city now. Maggie started uh, right around that same time um, at the Native Plant Society. And so Maggie and I became quick friends um, when we met each other and uh, really started to make some awesome changes really throughout the state. So traditionally, the greenhouses that we have uh, here at the city of Colorado Springs were only used to grow annuals. Um, and these annuals get planted all throughout the city on medians and parks and things like that. And then I met Maggie and we started making some big changes in the greenhouses um, and included native plants um, in the scope of what city horticulture does. So here you can see my little team. Uh, this year there's three of us. Um, and we are doing all of the um, seed collection for the native plants that we're growing. Um, we're growing them all in the greenhouses and then distributing them throughout the city. And then um, Maggie has brought all sorts of awesome community members to the doorsteps here at City Horticulture. And they've given us uh, donations, pounds and pounds of seeds that we've used um, and really been able to grow thousands of plants because of the partnership uh, between myself and Maggie. So City Horticulture and Colorado Native Plant Society work together really closely um, and we're really making some big changes here in the state. Oh no, keep going. <laughs> okay, so um, one thing that was really evident to me in the horticulture world is most uh, grows use peat moss. That is the standard globally to grow uh, horticultural plants. And the first thing that we started to do is change what that soil mixture looks like. Uh, because here in Colorado, for those who are familiar, our soil is pretty much decomposed granite. Um, so when we take these plants that are grown in peat moss and then try to revegetate a trail that's really made of rock, uh, the transplant success is almost zero because a plant is gr that's grown in this really nice peat moss uh, and then hits rocky soil just won't spread its roots. So the first thing we did uh, was really kind of hone in the soil mixture and we're no longer using peat. Uh, in our grow whatsoever, uh, which is huge environmentally, but also um, we're finding that this plant material is growing considerably better, faster, 
healthier, looks better um, in the native soil that we're using. So we've continued that. Um, the picture that you're seeing is the first year of the horticulture department using this. We're on our second growing season using this, uh, this soil mix and we're having incredible results. Uh, we do add some organic material uh, to some of the plants that we grow in the form of compost. So this is one of our compost piles and all of the compost that we're generating comes from waste um, in the greenhouse. So plants that get thrown away, wood chips, leaves from parks, things like that. And when we put all of this stuff together, we start to get these beautiful chemical reactions because of nitrogen. And this soil breaks down um, with microbes and fungi and different things. And it gets really, really hot, which is how we fry all of the weed seeds that would be inside this compost. So we're buying no soil whatsoever um, for our grow this year. And we're growing about 70,000. Here you can see a photo of my hands holding that soil and just how beautiful and nice that compost is. Um, and we've saved a ton of plants from going just into the landfill by composting. Um, last summer in August, Maggie and I hosted uh, a native plant summit, which is something we'll hopefully be doing every year now. Um, we had 61 people from eight counties come. And first, they just kind of listened to what we had to say, um, got them excited about our ideas and what kind of changes we could make in the state. And then we also um, had some hands-on seeding happen as well. So as much as we're kind of pioneering how to grow some of these native plants, we're also trying to empower uh, the community to do the same because it's so important not only that we have these native plants in our wild spaces and in our parks, but also that you guys are able to produce this plant material in uh, your gardens and at home. So here you can see uh, we absolutely stuffed the greenhouses full of people so they could come and learn. Um, we've got pots lined down the aisles so people could try their hand at doing some of the seeding. Um, and the more we do these community outreach projects, the more excited people are getting about growing native plants. And that is maybe the single most important thing we could do uh, for this local environment is just keep cultivating the plants that should be here anyways. Um, because these plants not only support us, uh, the people, but also the pollinators, the birds, the, all of the wildlife that we have. And uh, when it comes to drought, these plants can handle the drought. They don't need anything special. Um, so it's really, really important that we start to empower people to add these flowers to their gardens as well. And we will get, I'm going to go back a little bit. But see in all these pots, you can see what Alex is talking about mixed with that beautiful compost. We're using crusher finds, which is people have given it to us for free or we've paid $2 <laughs> at the landscape yard. But um, it's very, it's similar to our Pikes Peak granite. Um, and so just wanted to point that out because we were flying through that. We prepared lots of slides for you. <laughs> um, and I will stop here because Alex is the wizard at this in particular. <laughs> so we're finding um, a lot of revegetation needs throughout the state. Uh, Department of Transportation needs things for reveg, and the city needs things for reveg. Um, and the reality is there is not enough plant material out there, both seeds and plant material, uh, for the volume of revegetation projects that exist statewide. So one of the things that we've been doing are taking cuttings. So this is a cottonwood here. Uh, we have great success with willows as well. But we go into our open spaces and our parks and we collect these cuttings. So we'll just cut the tip off of a branch um, and then we'll leave the branches in a bucket for about a week until they root. And then we transplant them into that rocky soil that you can see. Um, in about three weeks time, we can produce thousands of cuttings that are rooted and ready to go for revegetation. So it's something that I'm really trying to teach people how to do uh, because it's very easy. Um, and there's not enough willows on planet Earth for the amount of revegetation projects that we have right now. So the more that we cut and put back into nature, the more plant material we have to cut again so we can continue to produce this plant material. Uh, but trees aren't the only thing that we need for reveg. So uh, forbs or flowers, as you would know them, are very important. And then grasses and shrubs as well. 
Um, and here at City Horticulture, we're producing all of that plant. Um, we're using a lot of dryland species, as you can see in some of these photos, um, things that don't need a lot of irrigation. But we also found that there is quite a need for riparian species as well. So we're doing both wet and dry species. And I know that sounds kind of funny for a state like Colorado. Um, but there are lots of riparian areas that are um, in need of some love and some support. So we're growing all of these different pond plants and creekside plants. Um, and here you can see kind of the soil mix that we're using. So depending on if it's a dry land or a wetland, species will kind of change the ratios that you'll see in the soil um, but again no peat moss and that's really a huge deal and also without with no peat moss also you notice that we're alex is not even using plastic in a lot of instances and in particular the forbs really appreciate to be grown in this soil block um, so the water can freely drain um, so the reduction of plastic, of course, is important to that carbon balance. We're getting roots that are sometimes four and five feet long growing in these soil blocks. Um, and that's a long, longer and larger root system than you'd see in any nursery plant that you could buy. Uh, so we're having really great success. He, here you can see just how big some of these roots are, even though these soil blocks are decently small. Another thing that Maggie and I have done um, is we will go behind or I'm sorry in front of trail crews before trails get cut and uh, lift some of that plant material so that we can take it back to the greenhouses and propagate it and then put it back after the trails have been dug um, and for things like cacti and artemisias especially we're having such good rates we can take one cactus uh, cut it into eight pieces and then probably get about 16 cacti going back out into these trails and these open spaces so as much as we're producing we are also trying to lift and save things that could potentially get um, bulldozed as a trail is being cut um, so here we can kind of go through some of the plants um, and their uses or importances um, before we do that are there any questions about like our general process it basically equals a seasonal engagement where we collect seed, we do winter sowing, we wait for the annuals to get out of the greenhouse in the spring, <laughs> and then um, we'll start the whole process again um, here in a couple of weeks where we're just sowing the seeds we've collected. Um, and a lot of those plants you saw in the greenhouse are now, they the greenhouse um, facilitates the germination, but they overwintered outside. Um, so these kinds of things could be accomplished without huge greenhouse complexes like you saw in the slides because all those plants live outside now in um, quart pots and then they're distributed as needed. So are there any questions? Questions, Aaron, that we have in the chat? Maybe you could walk through them. Sure, sure. Um, I, there were a couple questions that came by. Um, and I think you you may have answered part of this, but there was some more questions, a couple questions around, can you say more about the soil mixture? I know you said you don't use peat moss and you integrate um, kind of your own composting and some of the decomposed granite or um, fusher crines, but anything more to say on that to our audience? Sure. So um, we buy it from Pioneer or CNC. You can buy them from any bulk soil yard. And Maggie and I have found that true across the state. You're just looking for gravel yards, really. Um, but the product that you see here is called Cimarron Breeze. So this is the same product that um, is used in dirt road building and also trail building because it compacts really well. So it does have a little bit of clay in it. Um, but the majority, I'd say, is aggregates, very high mineral content. Um, there's a little bit of sand in there as well. Um, and then just a little bit of compost for some organic material in there. But otherwise, it's $32 a ton approximately um, for this, this breeze that we're getting. Some people call it crusher fines, road base, breeze. It's all kind of the same thing. Um, but it's got various size of particles in there and it holds together really well when it stays moist like that. So you can see on either side of the bench these plants are on, they do get misted every morning. Um, and the soil blocks will hold together like that no problem so they don't crumble apart unless they get dry. So we keep them decently moist um, and then we'll take these smaller plants 
These are probably what the size of a solo cup or a little smaller. Um, we'll take these as they outgrow their soil block and we will put them into a one gallon pot if we didn't plant this. Um, but something that I would say, I'll go back. These trays and these soil blocks are great for revegetation because one person can carry 18 plants to a site in order to plant some of this stuff. Uh, so we're also helping the rangers and the, the boots on the ground people who are planting this plant material back into nature because they can take uh, 18 plants out instead of one. Um, and this stuff is decently heavy. I'd say that's the downfall of it is uh, the weight of the material. But otherwise, the plants that are growing in them are considerably larger and healthier now uh, than anything grown in peat moss. And like we went to Durango and we just went to Durango gravel and there, you know, you can watch them actually just excavating the mountainside. Excavating the mountain. And one thing I'll note too is we learned when we went there that in the crushing process, um, that tends to add silica to silicates to the mixture, which is strengthens questions. Um, I think that's the main questions that I've seen in the chat, unless anyone wants to jump in now that has a live question. Yeah, I, I just have one real quick question. Sorry, not to get too detailed, but does this is this considered a, a well-drained soil, though, if you use this when you're planting for both uh, water-tolerant and water-needed plants? Yes. So this drains super well. It does not hold water very well. Um, but we use this material in both the riparian and the xeric plants. So for the riparian plants, we've actually um, built these little mini ponds that hold about two inches of water and they, uh, the trays sit inside the water. And a couple things have been really great about that for the riparian plants. First of all, um, it doesn't get too wet, which is important. Um, these plants right. don't want an anaerobic soil, which is a soil without oxygen. Um, so this really ensures that we've got a lot of good oxygen for the roots to move through. Um, and then the other thing that's nice for the riparian plants is we take this plant material and we go and plant it on the banks of ponds or um, creeks. And this plant or this uh, soil is heavy enough that it won't pop back up and float like peat would. Uh, oh, sure. So it's serving a lot of really good purposes, especially for those riparian plants. But it's great because we can just sink this right into a pond and it won't pop back up. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. And I will note too, um, the, the riparian mix, Alex uses more compost. Yes. Um, and so when you think about the plants that are in the riparian environment in Colorado, they are more deciduous. Um, so it produces more organic matter in the soil. Whereas a lot of these forbs we've been looking at, um, their overstory is an evergreen, some sort of savanna environment mm -hmm. or nothing at all, just out on the plains. Yeah, nice. All right, uh, Alex and Maggie, back to you. All right. Go through here. So now we're going to make a transition and Alex is going to just go through a bunch of really important plants um, and tell a story of their indigenous uses. And I'm sure he'll tell you about the seed collection too. <laughs> yes. Um, and one more thing that I'd like to mention before we go on is uh, everything that I'm doing is based on observation of how mother, mother nature is doing this already. Uh, I think a lot of the times horticulturists, I'm not um, trained in college or anything like that. Everything that I've done over the years has just been my own exploration. Um, a lot of people get really bogged down by the, the idea that the book says that something should grow this way or that way. Um, and we're having such great success because we're mimicking mother nature and um, creating pretty much the same uh, way of doing things. And it's just so much better all around when we pay attention to our surroundings rather than reading the books. Something that I say a lot is plants don't read books. Um, <laughs> so it's really important when you find yourself hiking or out in nature to just kind of slow down and pay attention to what's going on because I think you can learn a lot. Um, in and those like in these pictures, for example, I'm staring at this one thinking, look that's the native soil right so what we're mimicking in the nursery you, you're going to see this all these pictures are from iNaturalist which is a like photo obs or flora and fauna observation tool you can add that app 
And most of these pictures I took myself um, just hanging out with Alex. <laughs> um, but notice the habitat as we go through. So we'll start with yucca. Um, yucca is a plant that a lot of people tend not to like because it's spiky, but yucca is very culturally important um, and then also very important for the pollinators. So um, you can see those moths in there. This is the host plant for the yucca moth. Um, these blooms are actually edible and were a pretty common food source. Um, and then also yucca uh, in the root contains saponins and you can use it as a soap. Um, the common name often is soap weed yucca. Um, and this was a very important plant, not only for the soap and not only for the food, um, but you can also um, shred those spiky leaves of the yucca and make cordage with it, um, clothing, sandals, things like that. Um, and this is one of our most widespread plants in Colorado. I drove up um, the mountain Pikes Peak or Tava as the Utes know it um, the other day because we're gonna be doing some re-veg projects up there. And this plant is growing clear up into where the Alpine starts to touch the rest of the mountain. Um, and then all the way down, all across the Eastern part of the state. I mean, yucca is a very quintessentially Colorado plant and has tons of uses. And then you can see that photo with the seeds. So um, we actually struggled to collect seed off of this this year because these pesky little yucca moths, um, their caterpillars ate through a lot of the seed this year. So we go through and hike and collect these seeds and then bring them back to the shop with location data. We process these seeds and then we sow them uh, throughout the winter time in order to get a big plant. Next is um, bee balm or wild bergamot monarda. So I've been working uh, very closely with the Southern Ute Tribe and the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe um, here while I've been working for the city. We're working on building demonstration gardens together. Um, many Ute um, elders and different people have come and visited the greenhouses. We've had blessings happen here at the greenhouse. And this might be the most asked for plant by the Ute Tribe um, when we're talking about revegetating or building demonstration gardens throughout the city. So we're growing a ton of it. Um, there are really actually five or six different species of Monarda that we can find across the West. And for those of you in the East, there are even more. Um, this plant is used as a food. Um, modern, in modern times, people will use it as an oregano replacement. This is a very medicinal plant. Um, it's antiviral and antibacterial. Um, and then the hummingbirds love it. And anything that you can kind of see with this trumpet shape um, is going to be a plant that's a magnet for a hummingbird. Um, we find this plant in Colorado a little bit more in the riparian areas than we would in the dry and xeric areas. Um, but there are dozens and dozens of Monarda plants native to the United States, especially in the East. Um, so a tool that I would recommend people using if they want to find out whether or not a plant is native is called Bonap, B-O-N-A-P, and that's the biota of North America Plant Atlas. And that will tell you uh, down to the county level whether a plant is native to your area or not. Um, and this is a plant that produces a ton of seed when we harvest seed from it. Uh, so it's a very valuable plant to us because we can get a lot of plants out of one seed pod. Um, and another thing that's worth mentioning when we're doing these collections is we're collecting ethically. Um, so we're never going to take all of the seed from one plant. Um, we tend to take about 10% of the seed from one plant, and then we'll take another 10% with us and often we'll spread that as we're walking so we can ensure these populations remain in the wild. Golden currant, uh, this is a great one. A lot of people in the United States love forsythia because it gets those or, or those yellow flowers in the early spring. But I challenge people to plant the golden currant instead because around the same time it produces a ridiculous amount of these flowers and they smell incredible. Um, this is a very xeric plant. It grows into a larger shrub. Um, this is a pollinator magnet because it's one of the first native plants to truly start blooming in the state of Colorado and a very important food crop traditionally um, because it produces those berries. And from what I understand, the berries were often mixed with bison fat um, and were able to be stored for a really long time. And I think 
kind of across the board with a lot of the plants that we'll be seeing here, uh, they have a component of storage to them. And that's really important when we're talking about these communities that were um, nomadic because they needed to take this food with them as they went. Um, so the golden currants could be dried or eaten fresh. Um, and a lot of the plants that we'll talk about. Um, American plum, um, this might be one of the most delicious plums that you would ever eat. You're going to find it more in the lower lands and the riparian areas. And prunus is a plant family that there are dozens of uh, in the country as well, not only the state. I believe that American plum grows in almost every state in the country. Um, and the flowers are also very early blooming flowers. So very important for the pollinators. And oftentimes when we're talking about pollinators and birds, they're going to be most attracted to white colored flowers, yellow colored flowers, and blue colored flowers. So you'll see a lot of these early bloomers are going to have those colors um, because when the bee sees in uh, pretty much infrared, these flowers pop up to them and look super vivid um, and pretty much act as a landing strip for some of these pollinators. Um, but this is a great plant that you can plant at home if you're interested in gardening. Um, I have them in my yard and the flowers smell incredible. And like I said, that fruit is just absolutely delicious. Little spiky. Then we have choke cherry. This again might be one of the most important um, indigenous plants in the country. Um, I have a friend, May May, on the Inner Tribal Council. He's Apache, and he told me, and almost any reservation that you would go and visit, you're going to see choke cherries planted. And often, choke cherries were traded between tribes as a gift um, of peace. And so you see them everywhere. They grow everywhere in the state, but also all over the country as well. I grew up picking choke cherries with my nana. Um, and have such fond memories of this plant. I love the way the flowers smell. Again, it's a super early bloomer. Um, and a, a lot of people don't have a taste for the choke cherries. They're very astringent and bitter, but I absolutely love them. And I have memories picking all of them and just getting covered in their uh, blue stainy color when you're picking them. And then we'd take them back to my Nana's house and we'd make syrup or jam or juice. Um, you need a lot of sugar because, again, they're bitter, but choke cherries are just an awesome. Then we have yarrow. Yarrow is a very common landscape plant. We especially see um, cultivars. And when I say a cultivar, it's a cultivated variety. So these are plants that humans have bred for specific qualities that they really like. So we'll breed will breed them for a larger flower or for a specific color. Um, but when we're looking for medicinal plants, we want the straight species. Um, so common yarrow is a very commonly used medicinal plant. Um, it's especially used in breaking fevers. Um, you can make a tea with it. It's gonna make you sweat quite a bit. Um, but one that my Nana always had on hand if we were ever sick. And something that I really love about this plant is just how, uh, tough it is. It can grow super dry or decently wet. So this is a great one for your garden and it spreads. Then we have sumac. The sumac berries are um, one of my favorite edibles. They're very tart and lemony and delicious. It's like nature's warhead candy. Um, you can see they have a very inconspicuous flower, uh, but very important for pollinators um, and also a, a very important fodder plant for deer. Um, some people know this as skunk bush. It's kind of stinky. As I've learned to love picking the berries, I also really love the, the smell of the skunk bush, um, but a very common plant that you'll find across the United States. And there are other types of sumac that also have the red edible seed. Peach leaf willow, um, my native friends know it as red willow. Uh, you can smoke the bark of this plant but also it's incredibly important bird habitat. And you see these in most of our riparian areas throughout the state. Um, willows are a very huge plant family. There are willows all over the country. This one tends to be more of a shrub than a tree, um, but one of our favorite plants to propagate for revegetation. There you can see how it looks when we take a cutting that's fully rooted, then we'll transplant it into a one gallon, and then we send them out. Um, this year, we've got about 6,400 native plants that we've produced over the past year that will be going out for uh, revegetation, and this is what they tend to look like. Then we have the cottonwood. Um, the cottonwood is extremely significant in 
all of the American Southwest. Um, I know they're used for um, drums. So a good hollow cottonwood trunk can be used to stretch a hide over for drums for ceremony. Um, and then also kachina dolls are carved from the cottonwood. Really, you see the cottonwoods all over, even in the driest areas. Um, their roots can reach super deep for water, um, and they're really beautiful. I would recommend not planting this in your yard because they have a weak branch, uh, but I think there's nothing more spectacular than when you're out in the plains and you see a 70-foot giant cottonwood out on the riverbanks. They're just beautiful. Rocky Mountain Juniper, um, the berry is a common food source. Um, this is a very important plant in the ecology of Colorado, um, and a huge majority of the forests in the state are pinion juniper uh, scrub. So a lot of people tend not to like juniper, but if you're looking for a very, very tough plant, this is a great option for you. Um, the blueberry is also kind of astringent, but if you hit it the right time of year, uh, usually after a few hard frosts, those berries become really sweet and are actually quite delicious. And we have the pinion pine. Uh, the pine nut or the pinon, as I know them, come from um, the pinion pine. Uh, and when I have you people come up to visit the greenhouses, they're always like, hey, if the pinions produce nuts this year, you need to let us know because we will come up and we will get some. So uh, this is one that people just love. If you're from Colorado or New Mexico, uh, it's a pretty common sight to see people on the side of the road selling pinones. Um, Especially salted piñones are a snack that is very reminiscent for me of my childhood. So love the piñon pine. Very, very drought tolerant. Um, they're a shorter pine, which is nice. They don't get quite as big as some of the other pines that you see. Wait, can I say? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to add a picture of the pine nuts, but this species is interesting and feeds into the narrative of the nomadic lifestyle because typically like whole forests will only set nuts every like seven to ten years um and so once you have that bounty then you you would need to store it um and travel with it and i also wanted to i'm a biologist so i did put in here a picture just for general biological interest that the picture in the middle is a female cone and the picture in the top right are is the development of the male cone and a lot of pine trees have both both male and female cones but we don't normally recognize the male cones they're far up in the branches and very small in comparison when i was a little kid my nana would take us out to collect the piñones and we'd put a big picnic blanket underneath the tree and then we just shake the whole tree until all the nuts would fall off onto the ground so it's a, i'm very fond of this tree and then onions um We've got a couple different types of onions here in Colorado, especially uh, the farther east you go, the more onions are around. Um, but both the green and the um, bulb are edible. And this is going to be one of the first bloomers as well. And one of the one of the few Colorado native bulbs, we tend to have, ask, have people ask, uh, what bulbs can we plant that are native to the area? And I always tell people um, that our native onions are a great option and they're edible. And very easy to see and um, identify in the wild as well, which is nice. Ephedra makes a great tea. Uh, some people call it Mormon tea. I've also heard it called Navajo tea. Um, but this is going to be more of a plateau species, something that exists farther uh, west than where we live here in Colorado, but a great adaptable plant. Um, and this plant is bomb-proof. It can handle very, very dry. Um, and very, very windy conditions. Um, so this is a great plant and the tea is delicious. And then you can see in that middle photo, the flowers, um, it's a pollinator magnet as well. Wild strawberries kind of speak for themselves. We have lots in the higher mountains here in Colorado. Um, the berry is considerably smaller than what you'd find on a farm strawberry and considerably sweeter and nicer tasting. Uh, than the farm strawberries that we have. And often these are going to tell you that there's water nearby because they do not grow dry. And then we have um, boulder raspberry or thimbleberry is another word. Um, so this is a type of raspberry and it's not thorny, which is nice. 
Um, I have them in my garden blooming right now. The pollinators love these huge white flowers. Fortunately, the berry doesn't taste super well, um, but it is very nutritious and high in antioxidants. Um, we have the beaked hazelnut, which is um, a native to our riparian areas. And again, this is a great plant when we're talking about storing foods. Um, so the indigenous peoples would take the um, hazelnuts and they can be buried and stored underground for a really long time. It can be ground into flowers or eaten um, like this or roasted. Um, so there are a lot of great uses for the hazelnut. It's very hard to harvest though. Um, I use gloves when I harvest these because they almost have like fiberglass like hairs. Um, so they can be really prickly and kind of mean, uh, but very delicious. And then here you can see what it looks like. Those are not my nails, by the way. <laughs> um, what it looks like when we process some of the seed. Um, prickly pears, cacti are one that we often collect the fruit or the tuna from. Uh, it's delicious and it's sweet and it's full of all of these seeds. Um, Pensamins as well. So we're really becoming good at um, finding the seed material and how to harvest it. And a lot of people don't know how to do that. So um, we're hoping to pass this down to the right people because we don't want to encourage everybody to go into our wild spaces and over collect things. Um, but especially the Opunti are a great seed source for us and their fruit are just delicious. And here are some metrics um, of just the money savings that we have. At the city, we're um, not using peat soils and how much we can save composting. Um, so we're really saving taxpayer money while we're doing all of this. Um, but we're making our environment and nature a little stronger, a little more resilient by producing this plant material without peat moss. <laughs> yeah. And it's only the first year. Uh, so we're really excited to see where this keeps going yes. uh, because we're only going to keep growing our operation. And also, I will note a couple of things. This is all; these are all stats from last year. Yes. So over four thousand herbs and grasses, forbs and grasses, and we counted nine hundred and ninety-nine riparian stems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I will note too that um, the crew is using the um, compost mix that they're making for the annual production as well. It's not just the natives, but yeah. also no peat has been purchased for annual plant production that Alex also has to do. Yep. <laughs> um, and, and you know, like, so we have gotten some funding, but like we weren't able to use it because we didn't, we put in the budget that we needed money for soil. So we're reworking that. But like right now we're really focused on trying to raise capital funding for, you know, nursery space to do this um, because people ask us every single week and the asks are always really inappropriate like can you get me you know 500 riparian stems in four weeks which actually alex could do <laughs> but no one should ask that <laughs> so increasing the like production capabilities off of municipal property would help us to reach more people um because the plants that we touch here on in the municipal greenhouses uh, just go right back to those landscapes. So that limits our ability to serve a wider audience. Yeah, and some of the other outcomes, like this is a big one, like native seed is expensive, but if you kind of think about like the history of this landscape, you know, there's colon um, colonization and, you know, the raising of cattle and then the need to revegetate, but the only seeds available were the colonial seeds, right? People had knowledge from the old world and brought it here. But now, you know, on a writ large on the federal landscape, we have a contract with the Forest Service um, to participate in the region to uh, development of the Rocky Mountain Native Plant Materials Program. And other regions are much farther along in this process. But you got to kind of think about like the cart and the horse and you know, we still have a fundamental problem that for revegetation of our agricultural landscapes, um, the only seeds that are available are non-native. We're still kind of stuck in this crested wheat, smooth grown place. We still plant smooth grown, even though it's the most widespread weed in North America. Um, but as we have hopefully demonstrated that when people come together and they gain knowledge about native plants, um, seed costs can be zero, right? Um, and so we're trying to 
have a cycle where it really is a year long cycle where you collect the seed from the land that you want to restore and propagate it and put it back. Um, and so, but you see our production costs are low and I keep telling Alex, <laughs> To all this money he's saving in the budget, it should go to personnel, right? <laughs> like we, we do, this work does take people, hands, right? Um, and so anyway, some of these I, we've talked a lot about revegetation open, of open space lands, but there are also many new landscaping codes, um, all the way from the National Native Seed Strategy and the Infrastructure Law of 2022 on a federal level, down to Colorado State landscaping reforms and municipal reforms, um, what we're going to see more and more are requests to produce gardens like the ones you see here um, in municipal environments to demonstrate what a native garden looks like. It's not about rocking your garden, it's about using the proper plants. And one more thing, um, when we collect seed and open spaces, we take um, location data so we can ensure that that plant material goes back to the same park or open space, uh, especially in circumstances like the Garden of the Gods, we need to keep the genetics the same. Um, but it's so important for everybody at home to plant these gardens because the more native plants that you put in your gardens, the more seed will be available to go to those uh, post-ag places that need reveg. Um, it's not appropriate to take seed from garden of the gods and put it in an old farm field but it would be appropriate to take seed from your native plants in your garden at home and put them in that uh, so something really important that anybody can do is just keep putting native plants in your garden in 2022 in our first year of partnership people made this happen alex and i fortuitously getting our jobs <laughs> at the same time and we're gaining legislative support and i will say colorado springs has a, our first independent mayor of the last half century which we think will open some doors to a lot of what we're talking about politics is a big piece of this but a single human being judith rice jones was inspired by a similar talk in 2019 where i talked about like restoring the seed bank um, and restoring ecosystem services to our urban places and she left seed from her garden on my porch <laughs> for like a year and a half and then alex and then my garage just kept offering the seed back up <laughs> i didn't have time to plant it all and i just kept giving it to alex and it was that her seed alone really made a huge difference. And Aiken Audubon also supported us specifically in the realm of building riparian habitat, which is big. And no one wants to talk about the grasses, but they're the most important thing for carbon storage. But the shrubs, we really tried to focus today on, the give them a golf <laughs> clap, <laughs> Kendra, Jason, Julie, Kevin. Thank you. We are a nonprofit dedicated to furthering the knowledge, appreciation, and conservation of native plants and habitats throughout Colorado through stewardship, education, and advocacy. And we have chapters, seven chapters across the state. Plateau is based in Montrose and goes all the way to Grand Junction in the north. Southeast here in Colorado Springs, Denver, centered in Fort Collins. And all of our programming is free and run by our 2,000 plus members. And our favorite activities are to go on botany hikes and have speaking engagements like this and more and more with you today in a statewide thought leadership. And also for those out there who are engaged and active, these are grants and scholarships and projects like Native Garden Development. And our website is conps.org and I'll put that in the chat.